I was a kid, I played a game, you probably played it too, called King of the Hill. King of the Hill could be played just about anywhere you wanted to. You didn't need to really have a hill. If you had a dirt mound, that was great, but we would use a manhole cover. We would use uh, somebody's front porch. We would use a, a bed. We would use a chair, whatever it was. And the object of the game, you remember, is that someone would take their position as the king up on that, up in that position, and all the rest of us would try to push or pull with everything that we could to get them off of that position, to get them out of that particular place, and somebody else would get in, and they would become king of the hill, and then we would try to get them out of that position, and the game would just keep repeating and keep going on and on, and obviously no one ever stayed king very long because the idea was to get that person off the throne to get them off the hill so that somebody else could be there. We played that game all the time as a kid in different contexts and in different places. And it really, that childhood game is a little bit like a game that goes on uh, in your life all the time. It happens every day. Except this game is more appropriately called King of Your Life. And there are people that are jockeying for that position. In fact, you would be the key person that's jockeying for that position, rising to that position, seeking that position in your life, to be king of your life, to sit on the throne of your heart. And you have been trained, you have been driven since you were a child, since the day you were born, to be the person who could run your life. You have been, you have been created in this environment, you have been geared by media, you have been given it naturally, I mean it is built right into us, for you to be be the king of your life, for you to be the one in charge, for you to be the one who calls the shots, for you to be the one that makes decisions in your life. We all want to be in control of our life. We all want to be the king of your life. And one of the most important questions, the most fundamental questions you can ever ask about your life and answer is this one. Who is going to be in charge? Who is going to be the king of your life? Who's going to be number one in your life? Who's going to take first place in your life? We're going to talk a little bit about that day. Welcome uh, back to our series we're calling The Story. Uh, we have been walking through the Bible, just story after story in chronological order. And so I'm glad you're along with us. Welcome to our Sepulpa and our Coeta campuses. Welcome those of you that are just watching this online and, and learning and growing with us. Just for some context, let me remind you, we are in a time in Israelite history that is called the captivity, the people of God. Uh, specifically the southern kingdom are in captivity. They are in exile. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian Empire came and has now removed almost all of the people from Judah and from Jerusalem. In fact, the only ones that were left were the poorest of the poor and including the prophet Jeremiah. And we talked just a little bit about him last week. And, and we talked about how this whole thing led up to, uh, uh, and the reason why the people were there is because because they kept putting other, other gods on the throne of their life. They, they kept rejecting God, and they kept following after uh, the, the pagan idols of the neighboring countries. They just kept rejecting God. They kept doing it, and finally God said He could take it no more. And, and we talked about how, uh, how uh, it, it, even, we even experience this modern-day idol worship, that really worshiping an idol is nothing more than putting someone or something in a place that belongs only to God. It's, it's attempting to fill a position and, 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 and receive something from, from some place, somewhere, something uh, other, than, other than, than God in a place that God wants to deliver, in a place that God wants to give, something that God wants to give and we're finding it in some place else. But at the heart of all of that comes down to this idea of self-centeredness. Of us saying that we are going to get our needs met, that we are most important. And what we're going to find today in the story of Daniel in this period of time is, is that uh, there are some tremendous benefits to saying, God, I'm going to let you have first place in, in my life. And there are some consequences when we don't acknowledge him as that. So let me remind you, Daniel, one of the first that was taken captive 
to Babylon. He was in that first group when Nebuchadnezzar came in and initially conquered Judah and, and, and uh, uh, conquered King Jehoiakim. And uh, he took the, the, the youngest of, of royals and, and he uh, led them back to Babylon. And they were to become his personal slaves, his personal servants. And so he put them in training. In fact, we, we're going to read through some interesting stories. And I, I'm going to touch upon three stories that you are probably familiar with if you have grown up in the church at all. Three familiar stories that have this common theme to them, uh, as you'll see. Chapter 1, we find that King Nebuchadnezzar is, is taking these young royals back, and he's put somebody in charge of them, and they're to have a strict diet, and ultimately they're going to put in the king's service. They're in a three-year MBA program. They're going to be learning uh, lifestyles of, of royals, and so uh, they're in this program, and it just so happens that Daniel says, you know what, I, I don't want to define file myself with the king's diet, which included meat and wine, and, and uh, uh, it, it wasn't flying with the person that was put in charge of Daniel and his care. And Daniel said, let me do this. If you'll just, me and my guys, my friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you'll just let us for 10 days eat vegetables and water and find out if it doesn't benefit us, if we're not stronger and healthier and the attendant agreed to that, and sure enough, after 10 days, uh, that was the case. They were indeed healthier and stronger, and they were allowed to continue on this diet, not defiling, not, not following other standards, but, e but being able to keep up with the dietary standards that they had committed to. And, and at the end of the, the period, uh, they were put into King Nebuchadnezzar's service and they were found to be smarter and they were found to be uh, wiser and uh, Daniel was able to, to uh, be able to tell dreams, the meaning of dreams, and God blessed them. See, the truth is that when we are in another culture and when we're faced with such kinds of decisions and when we don't know who's going to be first place in our life, it's easy to adopt the standards of those around you. And it would have been very easy for Daniel and his friends to say, what's the big deal? This is what they want us to do. After all, we're slaves, we're captives, we don't have any option here. But they decided not to adopt the standards of the culture around them because they understood that there was someone else who was king of their life besides themselves. And so they say, we're not going to do that. And God is going to bless them. In fact, it shows, the story shows to us that putting God first pays off. Putting God first pays off. When we recognize that God is number one, that God is on the throne, we recognize that God is in charge, then, then we're okay with adopting His standards and not adopting those around us. And it certainly happens today, every day. Every day, we are we are questioned about our standards. If you're a person with any kind of value, godly standards, those are put to the test every day. How you're going to fill out an, an expense report. Uh, what you're going to watch with the other guys uh, around you that maybe you wouldn't watch in front of everybody else. What you're going to say about a neighbor to somebody else. All of those things that are culturally acceptable, that it seems like everybody else is doing, that no one calls attention to, you're just fitting in. When you're not sure who's in first place, then it's easy to adopt the standards of those that are around you. But when God's first place, when you intentionally put God in that throne, it's much easier to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maintain some standards. Well, that's chapter 1. You get to chapter 3, and there's another familiar story. This is the story about Daniel's friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in this story, King Nebuchadnezzar builds a 90-foot statue, a gold statue. We don't even know what it was. Was it a god? Was it himself? We're not even certain. We just know that he told everyone that when the music plays, you will bow down. And you remember the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to this statue. They said, we don't bow down to any god other than the one true God. And the sentence for that was that they would be thrown into this fiery furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar is so angry at them, he has the furnace uh, lit up even, even hotter. And in fact, the guards that throw him in die because of the intense heat. And even after they have been in there... They don't die. 
They tell King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to bow down. In fact, it doesn't make any difference whether God saves us or not. We believe He will, but if He doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. And yet, God saves them. And we see again that putting God first pays off. But you know what? When you're uncertain about who's first place in your life, it's easy to adopt the idols in the culture around you. It's easy to worship the things that everybody else worships. It's easy to worship the, the, the images, the statues. Now, we don't have carved images. We don't have golden statues. We've talked about how the idols around us are, are things that uh, maybe are, are, are not quite as obvious. But we have idols nonetheless. Careers and relationships and hobbies and possessions and money. All of those things are things that we put on a throne in front of God. And when you're uncertain about who takes the number one position in your life, who is the king of your heart, who sits on the throne of your heart, when you're uncertain about that, it's easy just to adopt those idols around us. Everybody else does that. Everybody else participates in that. Everybody else, does. it's not that big a deal. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to do that because God was first place in their life. There's another familiar story in chapter 6. Now, this one takes place with Daniel, and, and, and the situation goes, there were some guys out after Daniel, and uh, there's been a whole monarch change now. King Darius of the Medes and the Persians is in charge, and, and he's friends with Daniel. And some guys are out to get Daniel, and they know that Daniel prays every day, several times a day. And so they get King Darius to write an edict that says that if anybody prays to anything else, anybody else, any other god, then they're to be thrown in the lion's den. And sure enough, eventually Daniel is caught praying at his own house, at his own window, and he has to be thrown into the lion's den. What's going to happen? You know the story. God, God sends an angel, shuts the mouths of the lions, and, and he's saved. And it's King Darius then that runs out the next morning and, and is assured that Daniel is fine. And, and it's King Darius who is going to eventually write that Daniel's God, he is the living God. And once again, we see that putting God first in your life, it pays off. When you, when you do it God's way, when you put God on the throne, when God is first, it pays off. When you're uncertain about who that is, then it's easy to adopt the habits of those that are around you. And you know, in this particular case, chapter 6 of Daniel, the, the habit was not to pray to God. And has that really become a habit for our culture? We don't pray. It's become a habit for our culture that church attendance is kind of an optional thing. We get there when we can. We've got lots of other things, and so it's not that big a deal. And so when you're uncertain about that, when God's not fully in His place on the throne of your life, then it just becomes a habit that we might neglect, that we might not get around to. We just adopt the, the religious habits, the attendance habits, the generosity habits, the habits of a culture that are around us. But when we... When we understand that God is first place and when we give Him that place in our life, then, then it pays off. When, when we do that, it pays off. In fact, the bottom line to all these stories, I think, is this. You will, re you will never regret putting God first. It is impossible for you to regret it when you put God first. When you put God first, there's going to be a dividend. When you put God first, there's going to be some kind of blessing. When you put God first in your life, when He is on the throne of your heart, then, then you are going to, you, there's going to be a payoff to it. It may not be what you want. It may not be what you think. It may not be uh, turn out the way that you want it to, but it will never, it, you will never regret putting God first. And you know what, so much of it has to do with how we spend our time and how we spend our money. And you can tell so much about who's on the throne of your life by simply looking at your calendar and by looking at your checkbook. You can tell so much about your life and how you spend your time and how you spend your money. And we've said it before, one of the ways that you can monitor that, one of the ways that you can check that, one of the ways that you can build a discipline into your life is simply to do this. 
Give God the first few hours of your week. Give God the first few minutes of your day. Give God the first few dollars of your paycheck. Very simple reminder to you that has to do with your relationship with God on a regular basis. And so you say, God, the first few hours of the week, that would be Sunday morning, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time along with some other Christians making sure that I understand you're first in my life. Not because the church needs more people uh, in it, not because uh, uh, there, there's something special or magical about showing up at church. It's because you need it. You need to be reminded that God is first place and you're going to honor Him. Him by worshiping Him with other Christians in a worship service. Give God the first few hours of your week. Give God the first few minutes of your day. It's much easier to get up and go right into things, read the news, get breakfast, head off to work, do a workout. But when you give God the first few minutes of your day, you are saying to yourself, and more importantly, you're saying to Him, God, you're more important than anything else. You are on the throne of my life, and I'm going to acknowledge you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to get something out of it, that's for sure. I'm going to receive some kind of blessing. I'm going to be wiser. I'm going to grow in my faith. But I I'm going to be disciplined and just simply acknowledging that you are foremost in my life. I'm going to give you the first few hours of my week. I'm going to give you the first few minutes of my day. I'm going to give you the first few dollars of my paycheck. Again, not because a church needs it, but because we need it. We need to be reminded that it is not all ours, that, that, that it is given to us by God. It is all God's to begin with, and whatever we have, we're managers, we're stewards of. And when we give back to God, we are acknowledging that He is on the throne of our life. In fact, even God says, put me to the test. He tells us that specifically about our generosity. Test me and see if I will not come through on this. You'll not regret giving to me. You'll not regret putting me first in your life. You'll not regret putting me first in your finances. And some of you have tested God in that. Some of you have tried it out and you, you go, I'll never go back. I'll never work. But some of you are just going, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't seem work. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work out that way. It, I, I can't figure it out. It, it doesn't add up. Give God the first few hours of your week, the first few minutes of your day, the first few dollars of your paycheck. Because when God is first place in your life, you will not regret it. There will be a payoff to that. The alternative is this. In fact, we're given that in, in Daniel. There's a contrasting story. You're familiar with Daniel and his friends and their diet. You're familiar with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into a fiery furnace. You're familiar with Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. But you may not be familiar with Daniel chapter 4. In fact, we're going to look at King Nebuchadnezzar and what he had to go through to learn this very message about living for God. About recognizing God is God and Nebuchadnezzar was not. He's going to recognize that God is to be foremost in our life. And at this point, Nebuchadnezzar has everything. I mean, he is in control. He is ruler of the most powerful world empire. He's conquered Judah, which was just a little dot, geographical dot. But he's conquered nations all around, and he has everything that he wants. He has a palace that is measured not in square foot, but in square acres. He has uh, 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 shown himself as a world leader. He has taken on magnificent projects. In fact, these hanging gardens of, of Babylon, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, it was his pet project. Uh, the, the city of Babylon itself, an impregnable, impregnable city. I mean, it was this fortress, all of these things that he had. And, and Nebuchadnezzar was known as a, as a cruel ruler. In fact, when, when he finally annihilated Jerusalem and burned it down, he took the last king of Judah and were told that he killed all of his children in front of him, and then he, then he plucked his eyes out. So the last thing that was ingrained on, on King Zedekiah was, was the, the killing of his family. I mean, that, that's how cruel this person was. And so it's shocking to me that when I get to Daniel chapter 4, I realize it's written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. This, this egotistical, this, this mean, cruel dictator, he writes 
a part of the Bible? Let's look at what he says. Daniel chapter 4, first couple of verses. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and people of every language who live in all the earth. So it's him writing, and he's addressing everyone else. May you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. What? How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Now let me get this right. King Nebuchadnezzar, the guy that conquered God's people, now is writing a part of the Bible that says, let me tell you how great God is. You've got it right. That's exactly what's taking place. King Nebuchadnezzar has suddenly turned into a worship leader. He is writing this letter, sending it to the known parts of the world and says, let me tell you how great and mighty our God is, the one true God, how mighty his wonders. It's an eternal kingdom. He is going to rule forever and ever. This doesn't seem right. And you look at that and you're like, wait a minute, something had to have happened. What caused that change? From a guy that was doing all of those evil things and is all about the world and all about uh, enlarging his empire, and then you read those verses right there, what happened? What caused it? What took place in between? Well, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a dream, and there are going to be some circumstances that occur after this dream that remind him that he is not God that he is not number one, that he is not in first place, and that that is a position that is reserved only for God. In fact, skip down to verse 25. This is the dream that Daniel is going to describe for him. Nebuchadnezzar says, this is my dream. What does it mean? Daniel says, you will be driven away from people, and you'll live with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like the ox, be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone He wishes. You're going to learn a lesson, King Nebuchadnezzar, that you are not God. There is a God, but you're not Him. And when you learn that message, and until you learn that message, this is what's going to happen. The message is this, that life is going to fall apart until it becomes very clear to you of who God is. Unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't listen. He doesn't care. He's not going to pay attention to Daniel and the message that given to him by God. He's not going to pay attention to a dream because life is all about him. I mean, that's Nebuchadnezzar. Everything is all about him. That's all he's ever had to worry about. That's why his palace is so big. That's why his kingdom is so big. That's why he has been told all his life by everyone around him and by himself that he's special, that life is all about him. In fact, look at what he says, verse 30. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he says, is this not the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Those are dangerous words right there. Nebuchadnezzar saying it is all about him. He is full of himself. If we're not careful in the culture that we live in, It's easy to put yourself on the throne of your life. And life to be all about you and about your accomplishments and the things that you've done. All the good things that have happened in your life at your your source and at your strength and your wisdom and your capabilities. And it can become all about you. You can become the center of the universe. Everything can revolve around you. Everything can be about seeking happiness. But if you're there, ultimately the bottom's going to fall out and you're going to realize that the universe does not revolve around you. That you are not the center of everything. That there is a God and you are not Him. If we're not careful, it's easy for us just to seek everything about us. It's easy to pursue everything that has to do with happiness about us. It's easy for us to turn into people like Nebuchadnezzar and we're on a constant drive to fulfill us, to satisfy us, to do something that we get some kind of satisfaction from. 
I was reading about a girl named Melinda Rivera a while back. She has a rare uh, disorder called Prader-Willi, Prader-Willi disease. It's a genetic disorder which causes someone to always be hungry, but no matter how much they eat, they're never satisfied. When she was three years old, she ate so much, she weighed 45 pounds. She quickly, as an adult, turned into 400 pounds. She could never get enough. Because of always being hungry, her family had to lock the refrigerator. They had to lock the the cupboards. She would find herself stealing food. She found herself breaking into neighbors' homes. She could literally not control the hunger. It consumed her so much that she had to do whatever she could to eat. In spite of what she ate, she was never satisfied. That describes her world, doesn't it? No matter how much we get, no matter how how much we have, no matter how much we make, no matter how many relationships we have... It's just never enough. There's never a satisfaction to it. That's the danger that we are warned about right here. And if you are constantly planning, if you are constantly looking to what the next thing is in life, what is my next adventure, what's the next thing that's going to make me happy, if you're there, then you're probably the one that's sitting on the throne of your life. If you're constantly thinking about what you can buy, and if every dollar is spent on you, if you look through your check register, if you look through your bank account, and everything is spent on you, then you're probably the one that is sitting on the throne of your life. We recognize that God's people, according to the book of Daniel, are people that are characterized by putting Him first. That's all God ever wanted from His people. That that they would honor Him, that they would acknowledge Him, that there would be no other gods, including themselves, in front of Him. No gods before me. We We are invited, we are invited to worship and honor the very Creator God. And you know what we often do with that? We invite God to the boardroom and say, God, you can have a seat at the table. But I'm going to sit in the place of CEO. And, and God doesn't work that way. God doesn't share the throne. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to learn that. In fact, while he says these very words right here, we're told that the dream is going to be fulfilled. And he's going to experience those very things that he was uncertain about, that he did not want to figure out, that he did not want to have to deal with. He's going to experience that very dream that is going to become a nightmare for him. Before we do that, though, let's talk about how you and I can tell who's sitting on the throne of our life. Three questions I want to ask you. One of them is, why do you do what you do? It has to do with your motivation, doesn't it? Why do you do the things that you do? Is it always for your benefit? Do you always make decisions based upon what you're going to get out of it? Who's going to get the glory? Who's going to get the credit? Whose name is going to end up being uh, put before everybody else? Who's going to get, who's going to get the credit? That's, that's an indicator of who's in control of your life. Is why do you do what you do? Why do you wear what you wear? Why do you work where you work? Why do you do what you do? Is it for your benefit or is there something bigger than that? There's another question that helps us to discern that and that's who gets the credit? When things go good in your life, who gets the credit? Is that always you? When there's something good that happens, do you be, are you quick to say, I did that, I accomplished that? I'm smart enough to take care of that. I'm good enough. I I worked hard enough. I earned it. Do you give yourself the credit or is it a pretty immediate reaction for you to honor God with that? You know, most of us are pretty quick to blame God for things. When things go bad, we want to know why God caused it or at the least why God didn't prevent it from happening. But how good are we at giving God the credit for the good things that happen in life. Who gets the credit? And this last question is, what is the purpose of your life? What is the purpose of your life? What is it that you're after? 
What is it that you want to see happen? What is it that, that you want? If it's all about happiness and if you are after this, uh, satisfying this hunger that you recognize is never going to be satisfied, then that's not God sitting on the throne of your life. That's you sitting on the throne of your life. God's people are characterized by putting Him first. So we're looking at this contrast in, in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They put God first and it paid off. There was blessing. They didn't regret it. But Nebuchadnezzar was all about himself, about his power, about his majesty. And he's going to live that dream of being a wild animal, out in the wild, living with animals. He's going to go through a period of insanity for a time, uh, we're told. We get down to verse 25. And, and, and what Daniel is going to say to him is, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the press. And it may be then that your prosperity will continue. And Nebuchadnezzar is not going to listen. And he's going to deal with the consequences. He's going to deal with the very dream. But he's going to say at the end of the time, at the end of this time that that dream was fulfilled and I, I lived as an animal, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Did you catch that? He goes, when my sanity was restored, when, when Nebuchadnezzar was able to see things clearly, he recognized that he was not number one. He was not king. He was not first place. That that place is reserved only for God. It took a lot for King Nebuchadnezzar to get to that point. For him to get off the throne of his own heart. What's it going to take for you? What will you have to experience in life to recognize that you're not the center of your world? That you're not the one to sit on the throne of your house. What would it take for you to experience in life to learn that? The reminder in the Bible is that there will come a day when we'll all recognize who the true king is. That there will come a day, Philippians 2, when every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess the name, that name given by God to Jesus and we're going to all acknowledge who the king, who the center of the universe is. That at that name, we will bow down. And what's interesting is that Daniel, later in chapter 9, is going to prophesy about that very anointed king. In fact, you get to chapter 9, and he's going to get specific about the very time, in fact, in which Jesus is going to be born. And we we can go back and we can credit that. We believe He is the source for when Magi from the East are going to come about 500 years later and they are looking for the King of the Jews. Written probably because they had an ancient document from an old prophet named Daniel writing about a time in which a king was going to be born and they would come to bring gifts to this king. Only this king... His throne would be a cross. And His crown would be a crown of thorns. And Jesus would come and say, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to Myself. Which is what God has wanted from the very beginning. That His people would be drawn to Him and that they would live in community with Him. Who's number one in your life? Who's sitting on the throne in your life right now? Father, we thank you for the reminder today from your word, from your prophet Daniel, showing us this contrast between a life that recognizes you as, as our creator, as our God, as our king, and a life where self is put upon the throne. God, would you remind us that we will never regret Putting you first. 
God, would you help us in our lives to reflect that, that you are number one in the things that we do, in the way that we spend our money, in the way that we spend our time, and everything in between. God, we want you to be number one. We praise you in Jesus' name.